Hello and welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath and we are talking about In Search of Darkness Part 3. That's right, the trilogy that began with Part 1, continued with Part 2, is now concluding with In Search of Darkness 3. The campaign to pre-order this movie is now live. It ends basically Halloween night at 11.59.59 p.m. Uh, and there is an affiliate program. Whoever's link you use for this is who you're supporting. So if you use the Serial at Midnight link, which is in the description of this video, probably pinned to the top of the comments as well, you are directly supporting Serial at Midnight and you're getting the documentary. Uh, I wanted to do something special for In Search of Darkness 3. So in this video, we are talking to the man himself, the filmmaker behind the In Search of Darkness trilogy, David A. Weiner. Now, David is also a multiple Rondo Award winner for his time at Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. He's a prolific writer. He is uh, a long-term fan. So this is an interesting conversation because we're talking about not just the documentaries, but the roots of his fandom and the importance of basically fans supporting things for the people, by the people, avoiding the studio system, the, corporate, the, the corporations that make this stuff and release this stuff, bypassing that and just doing it yourself. Uh, independent creations for independent audiences. Uh, it's a really fun conversation. So support Serial at Midnight, support In Search of Darkness, support horror. Without further ado, David A. Weiner. <laughs> how, how are you like, you're coming off three, well, four really. So three In Search of Darknesses and In Search of Tomorrow. How, how tired are you? Are you exhausted? Or are you doing all right? Yeah, like in rel in, in, relevant to doing now four movies that are over four and a half hours in search of darkness part three is five hours and a little bit of change um it's a lot of work because we do lots of marketing as well i'm also working on uh, aliens expanded as executive producer and that's a lot of work on my end um but i would rather be doing nothing else with my life how cool is it that i have a job where i get to make genre documentaries long form the way i want them to be um versus having to go with a whole gatekeeping chain of networks or studios or saying you have to do it a certain way we get to do it the way we want to do it in in long form the way we started out doing uh and that was something that was encouraged by fans elaborate on that what you just said because i think that's really interesting the idea of a gatekeeping studio mandated is, so you're saying that narratives are controlled by the entities that own the properties is that kind of what you're insinuating i'm i'm insinuating to that to a a large degree essentially what i'm dancing around which isn't really dancing but just sort of i should say is that one of the biggest a frequent question i get is why is this four or five hours long and why is it not a series um and and the key reasons are it, it's uh, in search of darkness in search of darkness part one part two part three in search of tomorrow uh are our crowdfunded documentaries uh and in order to get these done uh and turn them around in about a year each there's there's some pre-production thought that goes you know development that goes we you know longer than a year but fundamentally we turn these things around in a year and if we had to make these a, a series um the only reason we'd be doing it as a series would be for someone else to distribute mm -hmm. well we distribute this ourselves you know it's crowdfunded by uh, uh the fans who love this these genre documentaries um and they ultimately are manufactured and distributed by us as well and so to, in order to maintain the the timeline and the creative freedom that we have to do it the way we want um you really take you know whether it's shutter or whether it's netflix or whether it's uh you know amazon whatever the whatever the distribution outlet is that's secondary to how we originally make these and 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 Originally, this all started as a crowdfunded project uh, in search of darkness, where we weren't even planning to do a four plus hour film. Um, but ultimately, the structure kind of demanded it because we do this each year, several movies, larger chapter in between, just structurally, the demand of it is you just got to go longer. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, you put in as much 80s horror goodness or 80s sci fi goodness as you can. But um, the last thing I'll say about it is that ultimately, 
fundamentally, I looked at things like when, when I knew that the In Search of Darkness part one and then the series was just going to go long, I looked to movies like Never Sleep Again, you know, The Nightmare on Elm Street uh, doc, which is long form, uh, and Crystal Lake Memories, the uh, uh, Friday the 13th long form doc, which I think, you know, exceeds six hours. And the, the love for those documentaries and the encouragement and the repeat views of those documentaries gave me the ammunition to say, I think the audience wants this and uh, will reward it with, with positive you know, vibes. And yeah. here we are at part three. You just mentioned uh, the Crystal Lake Memories. That, so that had a book. I don't think that Never Sleep Again had a book companion, but maybe it did. I think it was the other way around. I could be mistaken, but I, I remember- I think the book was first, right? The, yeah, definitely yeah. For, Never, for Never Sleep Again. Has there been any talk of a book for this? Like a uh, someone, one of my viewers actually asked me to ask you this. This is a, a Patreon question. Has there been any talk of like a book companion for this? Many times, many times, and we <laughs> we've been putting our minds to making a book, but I can't definitively definitively say that a book is going to be made or is being made mm -hmm. uh, because the it, it's it's a can be a cost prohibitive uh, endeavor. And we're a very small team. Creator VC is like 10 people, given, given, you know, expanding, contracting with contractors. And, uh, but ultimately, we're a very small team. And we like to keep it that way because we get a tremendous amount done. But then again, there's only so much bandwidth we have when we're juggling multiple projects, the marketing for each project, and the development of other projects. So certain projects, like a book related to one of our documentaries, is something that we would love to see. I mean, I'd love to have an In Search of Darkness, uh, you know, coffee table book on my coffee table. Um, but at this point, it's a dream, but it uh, might be a reality in the future. Well, one of the reasons that I ask is because you have, you are a writer. And, it, and it, for people that don't know, you're not just a documentary writer, producer, director. You're also an actual writer. And uh, you are a multiple Rondo Award winner, too, for your work on Famous Monsters of Filmland. You just cash, you're like, yeah, that's, that's a thing that happened. You've done um, your research, I, but I like hearing it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, that's the, the you, you are associated with quality, quality writing. So that seems like a good opportunity there. I hope that maybe something can happen there. Uh, let's get into fandom. You're making documentaries for fandom talking about, you know, ultimate representations of, uh, or ultimate looks at some of these franchises. When did you know, Hey, I'm not like everybody else. I'm a super fan. Was there a moment? I never thought that I was not like everybody else until I like showed up in public with my Star Trek shirt and felt embarrassed. Then I, I think I think I kind of, and I was 28. No, I mean, but then, <laughs> you know, I, I, as a kid, I just ate this stuff up and I never felt different because this stuff was on television. So why would it be different? So if I want to watch Batman, if I want to watch Godzilla movies, if I want to watch, you know, Dracula and Frankenstein and the mummy, you know, classic universal, uh, any, all that stuff, Planet of the Apes, that was, you know, Star Trek. It was uh, Space 1999. This, I'm, a, I'm a 70s kid and an 80s teen because I was born in 1968. Mm -hmm. So I could evenly divide those decades in terms of the material that was aimed at me because it was av very available. Uh, I never felt like an outcast. I did feel like a geek when I finally got to maybe junior high. And I realized that you kind of have to play it down a little bit. You know, I, I admire the kids of today who can wear their Harry Potter shirt or their Jurassic Park shirt or their, you know, their Pokemon shirt, anything you want to do, anything that's 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 fringe or mainstream, no one cares. It's just it's just fashion and culture and waving your freak flag or your fandom. So um, I, I knew very early on that I loved this stuff. This was not like an acquired taste for me. I I lived and breathed it ever since I was a kid and I was playing with my dinosaurs and then I saw Land of the Lost on TV and I'm like oh a show for me holy crap you know uh, and um, my entire making my entire makeup is the kid in front of the television of In Search of Darkness you know I was that kid that whole generation where I was sat in front of the TV because my parents were doing their own thing. And only after four hours did my parents say, you've had too much television. 
you know, only a half hour more, then you got to play outside, you know? Um, and usually I'd play outside just to earn my keep to be able to come back and watch some monster movies in the afternoon, you know? But I was like your, your typical kid who ran around and did sports and played with friends and ran around the neighborhood. But I, I got a massive amount of television and, and that was my foundation you know, watching all these old movies and genre films. And, and you know, I grew up in upstate New York, well, Westchester, New York in the tri-state area where they had this thing called the 430 movie. Uh, and uh, usually it was just regular movies, but usually once or twice a month, they would have some themed week where it would be monster week or they'd have Edgar Allan Poe week or Vincent Price week or Planet of the Apes week. Uh, and that's where I saw everything from fantastic you know, a uh, voyage to Westworld to any any and all Planet of the Apes movies to Vincent Price movies that I never would have known about otherwise. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the foundation that made me love and care for all of this stuff. And, you know, uh, I, I think like so many of us of our generation, we're now chasing the happiness of our childhood. You know, uh, these movies that I make in search of darkness, one, two, and three, in search of tomorrow, are all looking back and and rediscovering what these films mean and why we love them in the context of an era. But essentially, what they're doing, and I think in terms of the, the magic that these films have, that I'm just doing what I love, but what's there that I can't bring. It's what people bring to watching this, and what I'm ultimately saying is, what people bring to watching this is their own baggage, their own nostalgia, their own experience. So you can talk about Chopping Mall, you could talk about, you know, Jaws for the Revenge, you know? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how bad these films are or considered to be. These films mean more than just the film itself. It's the experience that we all had when we were watching these, who we were with, how we saw them. Did we sneak it? You know, did someone give us a bootleg tape? Did we see it in the afternoon when our, our dad said, we're going to the movies and that was a rare occasion, whatever it may be. So many people have said, I love watching In Search of Darkness movies because it reminds me of my father who used to love these movies and we'd watch them together. And so it really doesn't matter what the quality of these films are. These are incredibly important based on a full on experience that we bring to going and revisiting any of these films. In Search of Darkness 1, kind of uh, hitting a lot of the classics, and I'm oversimplifying, but In Search of Darkness 2 kind of widens the scope a little bit. What can we expect from the third? Is it, and is this the final installment? Or is this is the final installment of our trilogy of 80s horror. Okay. Uh, we, we have sights on 90s horror next, um, and uh, we want to do 70s. We want to do other eras, but we're a small team. You know, and I unfortunately have not been able to perfect cloning. Um, and, and every time I clone a new one, it's really disastrously wrong and it's its own horror movie and you guys don't want to know. So ultimately, we only have time to do one at a time. And so we finish, we're, we're finished with three now and moving on to other stuff next. But with In Search of Darkness Part Three, uh, I realized that it's at first we're like the, the bottom shelf, the underbelly of horror, you know, the dusty parts of the video store, you know, what have we not covered yet? But the reason, but the reality is, is there are, were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of movies made in this decade alone of the eighties. So many of them are really good. So many of them, no one saw except if you were in the theater or you found it in the video store, but it didn't get wide distribution. Um, but there were also plenty of theatrical releases that we just haven't even covered yet. So it's not like, all right, well, what's left over in the video store? We have lots of theatrical releases as well that I saw, whether it was in the theater or on cable or in the video store. Uh, so it's a mishmash and it's a variety, uh, but it's very much a companion to Insurgent Bark Tarkness Part Two versus part one. And like you said, part one was really the heavy hitters. Part mm -hmm. two, we got to broaden our scope internationally and, and focus on a lot of the more um, sub-genre titles, for lack of a better word. We get to go even deeper this time around. I'm still going around the world to places that we haven't gone, Asia, Mexico, Canada, 
uh, uh, but we're still doing spotlights on certain talent that deserve the spotlight. And we're still covering a variety of titles that I had never even heard of or seen before that I couldn't wait to dive into and say, this is perfect. But what's driving and fueling all of In Search of Darkness 3 is the community element. This time around, because we've recognized how important it is when everyone says, I loved In Search of Darkness 1, but how come you didn't do this? Oh, I was happy that you did it in Search of Darkness 2, but why didn't you do this? Well, we're never gonna get to everything, but we figured this time around, we really wanna drive the content based on the backers and what and just the fans and, and the people who follow us and support us. So anyone and everyone who said, I want this, this, and this, we did a very specific um, survey saying, what do you want? Let's vote on things. And uh, a wide variety of those are literally, you guys did the work for me and I'm happier for it because you want this, you're getting it. And that's what you asked for. I'm happy to do it because I want you to get exactly what you want. And while it's never going to be 100% what you want, and there's always going to be some things you didn't expect, this is like, this is the people's film, essentially. Wow. Well, that's a great call to action because that's, we can, it's for the fans. It's the, you just heard about direct involvement from the fans, how they can, uh, how they're shaping this thing. So, uh, Cyril at Midnight is going to be an affiliate for this. If you want to scroll down to the description of this video, there'll be all the links that you need. Um, there's so much that comes with this. I know there are these physical bundles with, you know, all sorts of, of delightful, <laughs> uh, of, uh, of, 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 you know, you know, things, posters and pins and all sorts of things. But there's also, uh, this community that you're talking about. There's watch parties and I've been, uh, a guest on two of them and there's a third coming up um, probably before the end of the year so those are always fun there's just a lot going on you guys really are focusing on the community aspect of this and I think that's very cool uh, is there anything I'm forgetting or that I'm missing that I should talk about with this no no but I think uh, it's 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 very important just to underline the whole community aspect of this you know we we thrive on the interaction with our community we're on I'm online daily we have a Discord, uh, all our social media platforms, we're constantly interacting, we're constantly putting out content for people to comment on and talk about. Um, we are in no way an operation where we say, say, thanks for crowdfunding this, see you later, we'll deliver this film in a year or later or never. Uh, we're very active with the community throughout, you know, so these watch parties keep us in touch with everybody, the daily Discord. You could talk to like-minded fans all the time. We have backer events. We just had one a couple of weeks ago for backers where I debuted two of the segments for In Search of Darkness Part 3 and two of the songs by Weary Pines, uh, which is an amazing score. They did all new music for this film. Um, I'm proud and happy to be able to show that to the people who have been supporting us give them a taste of what's to come to help them get excited, but also as a reward for their involvement and their patience and their support and their enthusiasm and their willingness to spread the word. Uh, because at the end of the day, again, we're a very small operation. And so we rely on, on, on good vibes and positive word of mouth to get this product to as many hands as possible. But fundamentally, we want people to know it doesn't matter how much we sell, we want to be able to fulfill this as something that the community really cares about, you know, and we want the community to know that we're all fans ourselves. We're not some, you know, unfaceless Hollywood entity that's saying, well, horror is good. 80s horror, that's a big thing. Let's just make some stuff. You know, uh, I think people can recognize that, you know, if, if by fault, a five hour film third in line about 80s horror probably means we we care a little bit about this stuff. I think the through line for this entire conversation is that the model is changing and this is the way forward. This is a fan, you know, fan creator, creators and fans working together and bypassing the entire uh, systems that have been put in place to to gatekeep this stuff, to keep, uh, go, go ahead. Well, well, to that point, you know, it doesn't, Hollywood films, can easily just get lost in the shuffle too. That's the thing is, I think I think the good thing is that over the last maybe five years or so, uh, people have really been re uh, responsive 
to crowdfunded projects, especially documentaries. Uh, that's taken on a life of its own, but more and more people who are who are dialed into this kind of stuff recognize that it's up to them if they want to see it, they've got to purchase it to get it made. You know, there's lots of people who don't understand how come I can't get you on iTunes, but uh, that ultimately hurts us if we distribute by that that way. You know, we've got to do it ourselves, however exclusive it makes the product. Uh, all our blood, sweat, and tears has to have some sort of return of investment. Otherwise, we can't keep on doing this and doing what we love. But you look at Hollywood movies, it does, there's no guarantee. You know, you can make a, a bat girl film and it ends up as a tax write-off. You could make a Fletch reboot and uh, a studio is not going to do any promotion for it whatsoever because they don't believe in it. And I've heard great things about uh, Confess Fletch. You know, yeah, it's not Chevy Chase, it's a new Fletch, but Fletch is based on a book, give it a try. But, you know, the marketing they had, I, I personally thought was terrible, but I've heard it's a great film and I can't wait to see it, but can I find it in a theater? Not really, you know? Um, so there are no guarantees in life, no matter what platform you're ultimately on. This comes down to, do we get enough money to make a film? Yes, we do. We can manufacture it and distribute it ourselves. We can control all of those elements. And above all, like we said before, the through line is the creative freedom to do it uh, as we, as fans would want to see it. And ideally the fans are receptive to the type of stuff we're doing because they know that we are connecting and caring to the fans in terms of the product that we're creating. Where can people keep up with everything that you've got going on? Not just you, you, your Twitter, social media, your website. This is a great place to just tell people where to find it. Sure. Well, in terms of In Search of Darkness Part 3, we have a campaign going from October 6th through Halloween at midnight, not Serial at Midnight, but thanks for being on Serial at Midnight. Halloween at Midnight, uh, we have a wholesale going through uh, to the end of October where you can get In Search of Darkness 3. You can get all sorts of cool posters and swag and digital download. You'll see on the site, you just go to 80shorrordoc.com, 80s. All our socials, whether it's uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at 80s horror doc and that's where you can find everything about what you can get if you missed in search of darkness part one and part two and you wish you had a physical copy you can get it through us so we're going to be selling a trilogy box set or individual pieces or you just get part three it's all there go to 80s horror doc.com you have until uh midnight strike of midnight on halloween as for me uh you can find me on twitter that's usually where i'm interacting the most uh, my Twitter handle is at Tiki Ambassador, but yeah, I also have that It Came From Blog site, so you can go to itcamefromblog.com or on my socials at It Came From Blog on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And there you go. That's the social media pitch. But uh, uh, lastly, I'll say, especially with uh, uh, It Came From Blog, that Twitter feed is like a steady brain dump of all the pop culture stuff rattling around my head. And it, it brings me lots of joy if I think of, you know, talking about Lee Majors earlier, you know, if I think about the Steve, the Kenner Steve Austin action figure and I find some ad that I, I, I responded to as a kid, I'll, I'll think of it, I'll find it, I'll put it up there and that's it. And people will say, oh my God, I haven't thought of this since I was a kid. And it brings me back. and it, warms the cockles of my heart with nostalgia. That to me is an incredible reward and I, I love to do it. That's great. Now I'll, I'll link everything you just said. It's linked in the description of this video and your link to the documentary project where if you click through that, you're supporting the project and you're supporting Serial at Midnight. Uh, so that's the best way that you can do that. David, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's I'm, Heath, Heath I'm, I'm glad we finally got some time to chit chat. And I really talk, love talking about everything and the kitchen sink, life, the universe and everything. So it's Absolutely. been a pleasure and keep doing what you're doing because it's a real great site. And, you know, the fact that you're a Gen Xer is uh, you now have a responsibility to keep doing what you're doing. 
right, guys, thank you. We'll continue continue the conversation in the comments below. I want to know what you think about these movies. We've covered so much ground here. This is a great uh, opportunity for Booberry. Get the Booberry, the vintage Booberry glass. Uh, great opportunity to talk about the, the movies that we love and the stuff that we want to share with others. So keep that conversation going. Uh, subscribe to this channel and uh, give us that thumbs up so you help the algorithm, the mysterious algorithm, find this channel. Uh, David, thank you again. Guys, thank you for watching. Until next time, we will catch you later. All right.